Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar today. My name is Lucy Moore and I'm a Professional Education Manager at ACCA. Our session today is designed to support your preparation for the Strategic Business Reporting SBR exam, whether you're taking the paper exam or CBE, and I'm really pleased to be joined by an expert tutor, Claire Dean, who you should be able to see on your screens, hopefully. Okay, let's start by having a look at the agenda for today's webinar. So after she's introduced herself, Claire will be kicking off the session by talking a little bit about the new format examiner's report. She's then going to move on to look at question two from the September, December 2020 exam, a typical SBR discussion question, working through the requirements, showing you how to plan your answer effectively and then write it up. And for those of you taking the exam um, by computer, there will also be some tips on how to use the software effectively and so on. Don't worry if you're not doing CBE yet because there will be lots of useful advice on, on how to tackle SBR generally. And we do plan to have some time at the end to take your questions. We have some colleagues working behind the scenes to answer as many questions as possible. Um, please note we can't guarantee responding to everybody directly, either verbally or via the web chat, but we'll do our very best. And um, um, hopefully the questions that we share at the end will be helpful to everybody. So if you'd like to ask a question, then you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can submit them there. I am now delighted to hand over to Claire for the rest of the session. Claire, over to you. Thanks, Lucy. Let me start by saying a warm welcome to our session today. And I'd like to just begin by telling you a little bit about myself, my credentials, if you like, for being here today. Um, I qualified as an accountant whilst working in the audit department of a big four accounting firm. And from there, I went on to work for one of the big accounting training organizations to make sure I got the maximum of all that knowledge I gleaned from my studies and inflicting the pain on the students. Um, I returned to um, my um, previous accounting firm to join a department helping their clients to resolve their technical queries under IFRS and also under UK Gap and provide them also with technical training. These days, I work as a freelancer teaching the financial reporting papers in the various professional exams, and I also deliver CPD training to lots of corporates across the world. Um, I'm here today in my role as an expert tutor for the ACCA in this SBR paper, and um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to start off by talking about the new format to the examiner's report. There's been a change which just happened at the end of last year with the September, December 2020 examiner's report. And they've improved it, so it's a super new examiner's report. But what does that mean? Well, it's got really detailed guidance, not just for the exam as a whole, but for each individual question. It looks at the requirements and it gives advice on how the examiner had hoped you might answer that question how they would have liked to have seen it laid out, whether you should be answering the requirements individually or perhaps putting them together and talking about them as one. And it then looks at the student's performance in that question and what the examiner found that they did well and what wasn't managed quite so well. This report is written by the examiner themselves, so I mean, there's no better advice available than that to steer you in the right direction. So if you are sitting the exam for the first time, or if you are resitting the exam, then this is definitely a resource to spend some time looking at. And Lucy has put it onto the resource section of today's platform for you to have a read through. Um, if you are resitting the exams, you'll find it really useful because it talks through what students, what many students did wrong. And that will then to make sure you don't make those same mistakes again. If you're sitting for the first time, of course, it will tell you those bear traps not to fall down in the first place. There are examiner's reports for the exams prior to this new style. So prior to the September, December 2020, we still had really good exam reports, but they were less detailed. So over the next few weeks or couple of weeks running up to your examination, I would really recommend that whenever you're doing a question as part of your revision and it's a past exam question, then going on the ACA platform and having a look on the website at the Associated Examiner's Report and what they had to say about that particular question. So 
So the focus of this session is looking at discussion questions or explain questions as you sometimes see them phrased in the exam. Every exam contains at least one of these questions and quite often, as I'm sure you've seen, they're based around a scenario. You might be asked to discuss the accounting with or without number crunching and where both are required, recent examiner's reports have said that the explanation is typically worth more than the associated calculations. So are you guilty of spending all your time on the number crunching and not getting onto the explanation? Well, in that case, you're going to find it quite tricky to pass that particular question. Where these questions arise in part A of the exam, they typically tell you which accounting standard you should be discussing, or should I say standards, quite often there's more than one to talk about. In the part B of the exam, these questions can still arise there as well, but sometimes they make you work out for yourself what the applicable accounting standards are. Do make sure you address all the relevant standards so your answer has the necessary breadth. You will max out for any particular accounting standard if you spend too much time on it at the sacrifice of covering off all the other accounting standards they're hoping you discuss. One of the toughest challenges is deciding which aspects of the standard are relevant to the scenario and therefore to put into your answer. The examiner's report for September, December 2020 clarified that there's no point setting out the requirements of a standard if it's not relevant to the scenario. Equally, rote learning big chunks of an accounting standard and reproducing it in the exam in the hope that some of what you say might hit the spot the examiner said that would earn very few marks, not to mention putting yourself under considerable time pressure. Now, I know how frustrating it can be that you want to show the examiner everything you've learned, but you won't get marks for going outside of the scope of the scenario. So if they ask you to explain the accounting in a particular question, and they ask you to talk about the impact on the profit and loss, then don't talk about the statement of financial position. You won't get any marks for it. And make sure you cover all the specific facts and the amounts given in the scenario. You must show the examiner that you are responding to the scenario rather than just giving a generic answer. Now, adding structure to your answer is also important. That's my next point here. Um, and the this is if you're using the computer-based um, exam software, you can then copy across each requirement. So I'm going to do that in my demonstration in a moment. And then that serves as your heading. You can then fish out the various issues and turn those into subheadings. And this then gives you a plan as to what it is you need to address, as well as showing the marker that you have thought about answering the question fully. Where calculations are required, a little bit on that. The examiner prefers these to be prepared using the spreadsheet. Or if you're doing a paper-based exam, then if it's a long working, pop it in an appendix so it doesn't get in the way of the main body of your answer. You do not need to copy the working from your spreadsheet back into your word processing document. That is not required. The marker gets to see both your word processing answer and your spreadsheet. So all you need to do is if you have done a working in the spreadsheet, is just cross-reference it back into your Word document so the marker knows it's there. Last of all, we have to think about the skill of writing a clear, brief answer. And it is a skill. Time is not on your side in these questions. So just let me share with you a few do's and don'ts. There's no need, generally speaking, for an introduction. Not unless it's something like a current issues question where there's a bit more time on your side. If you are giving an introduction, it shouldn't just repeat facts from the scenario. You've got to get going answering the question as quickly as you can. Avoid long, waffly sentences and try to stick to just one point per sentence. This is not a typing exam, so don't waste time going back and correcting your typing, or if you're writing, spelling mistakes if it's handwritten. The marker will be able to read through those mistakes that you've made, so it's not a problem. 
The market does need to be able to read and understand your points, though. So sparse notes that they can't follow or unclear workings, they're going to struggle to give you the marks you're hoping for. And finally, although the exam is time pressured, bullet points are not acceptable in these discussion questions. Right, let's move on to see the question for our session. And the question I've chosen, as I said, is a discussion question. It's come from the September, December 2020 exam, and it's question two called Calibra. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this question, and I've pre-recorded it. So that means if you have any questions as you're watching the video, then I will be available in the Q&A section to answer those questions um, live. Um, I'll also, if people have asked questions I think it's worthwhile sharing with everybody, I'll save some of those and discuss them with you at the end of the session. Are you ready? Now, I'm going to click the button which will take you through to the video. You can access the December 2020 exam from the student resources section of the ACA website, but instead I'm going to open the question in the ACA's practice platform. You'll find a selection of past exams loaded into the practice platform, but if you're wanting to work a question that's not there, then you can make use of the blank word and spreadsheet templates instead. If you're going to be sitting your SBR exam as computer-based, it's so important you practice using the platform lots before the exam. There are some ACA videos that show you around the software and suggest how to get the most out of its functionality, and I'm going to share some tips with you today in our session. In the practice platform, I'm going to open up question two, so click past question one, and here we are, question two, and the question is called Calibri. First thing I'm going to do is open up the word processor. Here you can see the response options that are given to me at the bottom. And I'm also going to open up the um, requirements. Now, already you start to see my screen's quite busy and I can't read everything because so many things are open. So the first thing I'm going to do is to copy across. I'm just going to widen my answer a little bit so we can see more clearly what I'm up to. I'm going to copy across the various requirements. You can just do it all in one fell swoop. And we can tidy it up once it's been copied across. Just make sure I've got everything in there. And there we go. So you can see we have requirement A. Oh, I can close this box now. It's done its job. We've got requirement A discuss, and that's five marks. Put a bit of space in there. You can see the next requirement more clearly. Provide some accounting entries three marks, and discuss, and this one's to do with ethics. So there's 10 marks plus a further two marks. Those are your professional marks. So if I just tidy this up, I've got 12 marks altogether, including the professional skill marks for part C. Okay. Now, this is a 20-mark question. And that means at 1.8 minutes a mark, we've got 36 minutes to complete our answer. I'm going to allocate the time to each of the requirements. I'm going to write it down to remind myself. So five marks at 1.8 minutes, that's going to be nine minutes. Then I've got three marks times 1.8, that's five and a half minutes. And lastly, down here, I've got 12 marks. So that's a stonking 21 and a half minutes, including those professional skill marks. It's important to do this time allocation, as the examiner's report in most exams talks about students having spent too long on a particular question. And if you do that, you run the risk of reaching the maximum mark well before the end of your answer. So the examiner advises actually doing a bit of a plan on these discussion questions to help keep you on track. You can then set out what it is you need to get done, how much time you've got to do it, and that will keep you very focused and hopefully less risk of overrunning. Now, going back to the actual main body of the question, there's not a great deal there. If I just move this down, you can see it says Calibri operates in the property sector. And it's invested in some new technology called distributed ledgers blockchain. Panic sets in. I haven't got the slightest idea you might think what that means. But 
as you'll see in a moment, it doesn't actually matter if you've never heard of blockchain technology before. The great thing it says, look, it's new technology. And you'll see it's not to do with the accounting for this system. It's just an appreciation of the system. This new technology has been used by the business for the first time. It's worthy of noting the year end. So I can highlight that. You can use the highlight facility in the software because especially in these financial reporting questions, knowing the year end means that when I come to a transaction, I can then consider the timing of that transaction in the context of December year end. Right, on to that plan. Let's briefly have a look at each of the requirements. So again, we can set out what it is we need to get done in the time provided. Part A, discuss how Calibri should have accounted for the set of the apartment blocks. Well, straight away that tells me there's some dodgy accounting in Part A that I'm going to have to visit. How should they have accounted for the set of the apartment blocks? Well, sale of apartments. I start to think about property, plant and equipment and disposal of PP&E. Oh, but look, it says in accordance with IFRS 15. That's a revenue standard. So that means Calibri must be selling these apartment blocks as inventory, and therefore the revenue stream falls under IFRS 15. They want me to discuss not just IFRS 15. Can you see? We've also been asked to talk about IS 23 as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy each of those two accounting, accounting standard numbers and names, and that's going to provide the framework for my answer. That's going to make sure I don't forget to talk about the borrowing costs and spend all my time talking about the IFRS 15. Because remember, again, you'll max out. They won't be able to give you the borrowing costs and allocate them instead to your wonderful revenue answer. You'll have maxed out in your answer. Okay, that's part A. And it's discuss. So it's important that we refer to what's going on in Calibra when we come to answering this particular question. Part B, provide the accounting entries that will be required. So accounting entries are journals, debits and credits. So I'm going to think about what the journal entries are going to be. And it says it wants the journal entries to record what they should have done for the set of the apartment block on the 1st of January. So I'm going to write down the date here, because if you remember, you can see highlighted up above my December year end. And this transaction has happened at the beginning of that year. They want to know what the accounting is going to be on that date when the transaction happens and also over the construction period of two years. So that means I also need to think about what's going to happen at the 31st December 2000X8. And I'm going to copy that, save myself a bit of time and just change the final number to X9, the second year in the question. And again, I'm going to have to insert journals into here with space, and I can add a little bit more later on when I get there. Now, the last requirement, part C, is a requirement to discuss the ways in which the chief accountant should have acted to ensure he maintained ethical standards. Okay, so here we're looking at an ethics question, and that's why we have the two professional marks. Now, you can see they refer us to a couple of exhibits, exhibits two and exhibits three. So we haven't looked at the exhibits yet. We've got the chief accountant and Bedini and the distributed ledger technology. And actually, look, they're referred to in the main stem of the question. And generally speaking, the examiner gives a little bit away in that main stem of the question. Look, in exhibit two, we're going to find something about the relationship between the chief accountant and Bedini, who's a customer of Calibra. All right, I'm going to pop that down to make sure that when I come to that part of the question, I consider any ethical issues around that relationship. And then in exhibit three, oh, this is a dreaded distribution ledger technology, describes how Calibra has used the technology to trade property. So they've been using this new technology. Maybe there's some ethical concerns around that technology that I need to explore. And also, oh, here's another one. The chief accountant doesn't seem to know very much about that technology. So straight away, I've already got some ideas about what I'm going to be discussing when I come on to part C of my answer. So that's my broad structure. And now I'm going to start going back and actually answering the question. All right. So I've done with the main stem of the question. So 
actually now I can do a little bit more rearranging of my screen to make it work for me. And I'm going to open up my first exhibit. And my first exhibit is around these apartment blocks, so I can do the accounting part of the question. So as I said, a bit of tidying up of your screen so it works for you, so you don't have too much scrolling around. That is exhibit one. Just make sure you haven't missed anything that scrolls down. No, that's everything there. And I can then use the rest of my page. Making sure you don't go over the navigator at the bottom. I can use the rest of my page for my word processor answer. Super. So let's have a proper read through part A and also the exhibit. As we go through, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be jotting down some thoughts because what's so important for these discussion questions is you don't give a generic answer around IFRS 15 or a generic answer around IS 23. In fact, the examiner has said that they expect a little bit more of students now because um, the revenue standard has been around for well, quite some time in the syllabus. And so they're not looking for you to regurgitate the whole of IFRS 15. What they want us to do is to work out what are the pertinent parts, the relevant parts of IFRS 15 in the context of our particular scenario. So here goes, let's have a read through. Calibri builds apartment blocks. They normally take two years to complete from the date of signing the contract. Okay, so that's interesting because it might be that I'm going to spread my revenue over the two years. That might be the case. So what I'm going to do is, again, use my copy and paste, so Control-C, Control-V, to put down what I think are key points from the scenario that I want to build in my answer. This is my plan at the moment, and I can add a few more words and augment it to give my final answer in a moment. The title and possession and therefore control of the apartment blocks passed to the customer upon completion of construction. Ah, oh, that's interesting because that means that I'm not going to spread my revenue over the two years because the whole premise of IFRS 15 is you book your revenue when you have transferred control. So straight away, I know that one of the things I want to talk about in my answer is the timing of my revenue recognition. And I'm actually going to put that as a subheading. As a marker, it just makes your life so much easier if people have put some structure to their answer. I tell you, I've marked these exams, I've marked this paper, and it's so much easier if you've got some, some headings to show what the student's about to talk about. All right, what else have I got? I've got some discussion about the price. The price is payable on completion of each apartment block at 9.55 million, or instead, customers can pay 8.5 million on the day the contract is signed. So not only about revenue recognition, another thing I need to consider is how I'm going to calculate, determine the transaction price. Okay, so I've just gone in there are five main areas that IFRS 15 discusses, and I've picked out two of those areas, determining the transaction price and deciding when to recognize the revenue. And the transaction price, now what it says is the price is 9.55 if they wait until completion. So I'll pop that down so I've got the information to hand. Oops, completion or it is 8.5 million if you pay up front. Okay. And interesting enough, they tell me they've worked out an appropriate borrowing rate of 6%. And you think about how I'm going to use that in my answer. So I pop that down. I have a little think about that in a moment. And then it says Calibri at the moment has been recognizing or has had a go at the accounting and has recognized 8.5 million. So that's what they've done. They've recognized the 8.5 million as soon as the customer has paid. So I need to consider whether that is right. And so that kind of addresses both parts, the revenue recognition. What they've done is they've recognized it at the moment when the customer signs the contract. Maybe I'll put it down twice. Maybe I'll pop it down here as well. And then I can consider the amount, the appropriateness of the 8.5 in a moment. And if you wanted to, you can actually now get rid of that exhibit because I've got everything I need in my word processor. And I can open it up and have a lot more space to see exactly what it is I'm going to write about. 
Okay. Now, don't forget you've got another accounting standard somehow or other to weave into your answer. I is 23. So I've got that there and I'm going to make sure I don't forget that as I go through and complete my answer. Maybe you're not quite sure at the moment what it is to say about that. All right. So let's have a think as we go through. All right. So now I have a plan. I'm going to go back and actually write up my answer. I'm going to think about my exact wording I'm going to be using. So starting with the revenue recognition. Let's start with what the company has done so far. So we can take that little bit there. And this is a great thing about doing your exam with the CBE is you can really save yourself so much, especially if I can get it to behave. There we go. Um, they have recognized 8.5 million when the customer signs the contract. So let's get over the number for the moment. The company has recognized, so Calibri, reference the company's name or Calibra has recognized revenue up front on receipt when the customer signs the contract. Okay, so putting it out there, that's what the company's done so far. Then I'm going to say what they should have done. However, revenue should be recognized when the performance obligation is satisfied. That's what it says in the accounting standard. Step two is determining what the performance obligation is. When you get to step five, you can then determine whether that obligation has actually been met. And I'm going to say what that means in the context of this question. So here, as we know, this is when the customer takes title and possession, which is only upon completion of construction. So just make sure my sentence reads properly now. Revenue should be recognized when the performance obligation is satisfied and can say which is when title when the title and possession and therefore control of the apartment blocks pass to the customer upon completion of the construction, we can say in two years' time. All right. So now I can just get rid of the bits I've talked about. I've said it normally takes two years. I've talked about the two years and I've talked about the transferring of the control. So that's my revenue recognition done. You see how neat and tidy it is if you um, just use the functionality of the software. Then we move on to the transaction price. And it's a case of, is it 9.55? Is it 8.5? How do I know what the right amount is? Well, again, think about what they've done. It says they've recognized 8.5 million when the customer signs the contract. So let's talk about that first of all. So the 8.5 million or the transaction has been measured at 8.5 million okay now if we think about the debits and credits that cash has come in So on receipt of the advance payment, we've got a debit to cash of 8.5. So I can't change that number. It's 8.5 for sure that's come through as cash. But where does he have half the double entry go? Can't take it to revenue yet because I've just discussed that in my previous paragraph too soon. So I've got their money, but I haven't yet delivered. I haven't yet delivered on the performance obligation. So can you think where it goes? You debit cash and you credit a liability. Calibra has got an obligation to do something in return for the 8.5 million it's received. So that's going to be the completion of my sentence. The transaction has been measured at 8.5 million receipt of the advance payment, which should be recognized as a liability, and then say why. It's to reflect the obligation for Calibra to provide construction services. 
Oops. Construction services. Now, what about this interest rate? And what about that 9.55 that they mentioned as well? Okay, remember the 9.55 was discussed <coughs> as the price on completion. So how am I going to build this into my answer? Well, if you think we have taken 8.5 million from the customer and we're going to sit on that money for the next two years until we finish the construction. So effectively, I am borrowing their money. I'm borrowing that money, that $8.5 million I am borrowing for the next two years. And so the accounting that we're required to do under IFRS 15 is if we're taking money in advance, we have to reflect the interest that effectively we would incur if we would borrowed that money, let's say, from a bank. So the difference between the advance payment, oops, payment of 8.5 million, and the normal price of, what was it, 9.55 million represents interest incurred by Calibri. Okay. Now, what am I going to do with this interest? Because I have to do something with this. this there's a standard. I can't just ignore it. So what we do with the interest is we're going to think about IFRS 9. We're going to accrue the interest over the period in which we're providing the service to Calibra, over the period of the construction. So continue my answer. This interest should be accrued, so spread over the two years of construction. Now, how are we going to calculate the interest? They gave us this 6%, an appropriate borrowing rate, they said, of 6%. So what's meant by appropriate? Well, let's have a chat about that. The interest rate of 6%, what it should do is it should reflect the rate that Calibra will be charged if they've gone and borrowed the money from a bank. So it should reflect their credit characteristics. Yeah, how risky the bank perceives Calibra to be. So the interest rate of 6%, given they said it's appropriate, let's talk about what appropriate means. It reflects the credit characteristics um, of Calibra. Now, it's not necessary to talk about this, but you might have noticed that, I'm going to just jot this down here so you can see, Another way of thinking about that 6% is it's what discount rate would I need to apply to the 9.55 million? So what discount rate would I need to apply to the 9.55 million? So if I discount it back the two years, um, if I discount it back, so that's not the right button. If I discount it back the two years, it would get me back to 8.5 million. Okay, that's what the 6% is. When you actually check in your calculator, you actually see that that 6% does make that equation balance. So you can talk about that in your point as well. So if we didn't know what the rate was for Calibra, we should really know what our rate would be. But if we weren't sure, we could also determine the rate of interest as the rate at which the future payment of 9.55 million would be discounted to obtain the advance price of 8.5 million. Okay, so it's basically your internal rate of return. Super. Now, you might think you're finished. You might feel like you've definitely done enough there, but we haven't yet discussed IS-23. And we don't really have much of an idea about what to say about IS-23, but hopefully we do now, because if we think again about the double entry, it's always a great one to go back to these discussion questions. If you ever get stuck, is think, well, what would the other half of the double entry be? We're going to accrue for the interest. That means what we're going to do with the interest is add it on to our liability and our balance sheet each year. But where does the other half go? 
If you credit the liability, what are you going to debit? Well, IS-23 talks about borrowing costs on qualifying assets. And depending where you've got to in your studies and your revision, you may or may not remember a qualifying asset is an asset that's going to take a period of time to build. That could be property, plant and equipment, or in our case, it's inventory, isn't it? We are building these apartment blocks for customers. So the interest that we've just calculated is directly attributable. And it's great if you can use the buzzwords from the accounting standard, because that's what the marker will have on their marking uh, plan. The interest is directly attributable to the cost of constructing the buildings, which will be sitting in inventory. Remember, they won't be in PP&E. They'll be sitting in inventory because I'm not keeping them to use myself. I'm going to sell them on to customers. Now, in the examiner's report, they actually mentioned that people got confused and thought they were PP&E, but they're inventory. So the interest is directly attributable to the cost of constructing the building sitting in inventory. And as this inventory is a qualifying asset, as in it's an asset that's discussed in IS-23 as being eligible, and it's been constructed over a considerable period of time, two years, then IS-23 would require us. It's not a choice. You must capitalize the interest. And what that means is the interest is added to the cost of the inventory instead of expensing it to the profit and loss account. All right. I'm sure there's some typos in there. I'm sure there's a few words missing, but that is my answer. My answer for five marks, nine minutes, requirement A, done. Now, you'd be really relieved to hear that part B is a walk in the park having done part A, because all we need to do in done part B is turn the arts we've discussed above into journal entries. So journal entries are our debits and our credits. Now, I'm hoping none of you would take this approach of, oh, I've got part A wrong. There's no point bothering with part B. I've made such a dog's dinner of part A that I might as well just give up on part B and move on to part C. Wrong approach. Because there is a rule of single jeopardy when marking exams. I can't penalize you for the same mistake twice. So if you have made a mistake, if you've misinterpreted the scenario or you've misunderstood the requirements of IFRS 15 or IS 23 in your discussion, providing your journal entries are consistent with your discussion up above, then I will give you marks, okay? Because I can't penalize you twice for the same mistake. Remember that. So the first thing to do is to think about the transaction on the 1st of January. So a customer has signed on the dotted line, taken out a contract, and has decided to pay me up front. That means they've paid me the 8.55 million. So here we go, debit, cash, 8.55 million. And we said we can't take it to revenue yet because I haven't yet transferred control. So I can't put it into revenue. I'm gonna put it into a liability. I have an obligation to deliver on that contract a liability of 8.55 million. Now, the examiner's comments said that some students were writing words underneath, explanations about what this journal's doing. You don't need that because you've already done your explanation back in part A. You don't want to duplicate your answer. That's a waste of your time. You won't get any brownie points for it. Then we move on to the 31st December, the end of the year. So this is where we're going to start to accrue for the interest. The interest rate, if you remember, was 6%, and we're going to apply that 6% to the 8.55 that effectively we've borrowed from our customer. Okay, so 6% uh, was an 8.55. Was it 8.5? Actually, I've got an extra 5 there. Let me get rid of that so I don't confuse anybody. So 6% of 8.5 million, I make that 510,000. Okay, so that's the interest that we've accrued. All right, now I would put a little working down because we haven't done the workings in our explanation. And the risk is if you do it all in your head and put the number down, you've made a mistake. I've got nowhere to go when it comes to giving you marks if I haven't got a working to follow. All right, so always jot them down. I'm going to take that interest. I'm going to add it on 
to my liability, I'm going to accrue it for the year. So that's 0.51 million. And remember, instead of charging the interest to the P&L, I'm going to add it on to the inventory, my partly constructed building that's sitting in inventory at 0.51 million added there. Okay, that's the 31st December X8. One more year to go. We get to the end of the next year. So again, it's another 6%. Ooh, but be careful. I bet you attempted to do the same amount of interest again, weren't you? We need 6% of the new liability. It was 8.5 million the last time we looked, but we've gone and added on another 0.51 to the liability. So it's 6% of the whole lot. So 6% of 9.01 million, and I make that 541,000. So same again, and look, make life easy for yourself. Just copy that journal down from 2008 to 2009, and then just, you can just change the numbers. So instead of being 0.51, it's going to be 0.541 and 541 to the liability. Have I finished? I've done three journals, three marks. Oh, you think I've finished. But there's another journal. How sneaky is this of the examiner? There's another journal to talk about on the 31st of December, X9. What have we not yet done? What's this question all about? It's all about revenue recognition. I haven't recognized any revenue yet. So what was going to happen at the end of X9, two years after the contract was signed, is I'm going to deliver my finished property to my customer. So now I have discharged my liability, and the liability is going to go from my, to my statement to position, and it's going to be emptied into revenue. So let's work out how much we need to release. We started off with 8.5 million, and we increased it by 0.51, and we increased it again by 0.541, which I get to be 9.55 million. Does that number ring a bell? That was the number in the question, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the alternative. Instead of paying up front, they could wait and pay 9.55. So my revenue number is unaffected by whether they pay up front in advance or they pay on completion. So 9.55 comes out of the liability and it goes into revenue and that is part B finished. So we're going to move on to the final part of the question. All right, I just scroll down. I've got all my thinking already. Isn't this wonderful? It just makes life so much easier if you are able to use the software for your exam. Part C, discuss the way in which the chief accountant should have acted to ensure he maintained ethical standards in dealing with the issues described in Exhibits 2 and 3. Hmm, okay, Exhibits 2 and 3, we haven't even looked at them yet. So I'm just going to shrink my word processor down for a moment. Move that down there, scroll down a little bit. And let's open up Exhibit 2. Let's have a read. Let's find out what dodgy things have been going on. So the chief accountant does not hold a permanent contract. Oh, that sounds quite interesting. So he is a temporary employee, but he has applied for a permanent position. Oh, he's out to impress them, isn't he? He's applied for a permanent position. So that's something to note down, put that down there. What else? He's to be interviewed in the near future. Okay. And Bedini, a customer of Calibra, wants to take advantage of the reduced price, but, oh, he wants his cake and eat it. He wants to take the reduced price, but not pay up front. Hmm. The chief accountant, therefore, has allowed him to pay the reduced amount, but take a month's credit. Okay. So the chief accountant has given some abnormal terms, okay, some abnormal terms. All right, so that's something worthy of noting down. Um, anything else? In return, ah, oh, here's the quid quo pro. In return, Bedini has agreed to provide a good employment reference. Hmm, this doesn't sound very ethical to me at all. 
sounds like I might have a concern here. Well, we'll talk about what that concern is in a moment. The chief accountant was afraid he might lose Bedini as a customer if he did not agree to the delay in payment and also not get the reference either. So we've got fear of losing Bedini. We've already mentioned the reference, so let's pop that down there. Hmm, that's built a little picture in my mind already. So that's my first thing. That's exhibit number two. Let's now take a look through exhibit number three. So let me close that one down and open up. Oh, it's that distributed ledger technology, this blockchain thing that you're probably thinking I don't know very much about, Claire. Neither do I, don't worry. Calibri Co. has recently used distributed ledger technology in a, to sell shares in properties to investors. Okay, so it's new technology. These digitized transactions are visible to authorized parties. The chief accountant is publicly supporting this technology and is going to manage the new system. Well, good for him. So let's pop that down here. That might be a pertinent point to use. However, oh, look, he's got concerns about the reliability of the due diligence carried out and the fact that it might violate local regulations. So that's two points there. The directors of Calibri want to increase the number of transactions. So they want to grow their use of that software, that technology. Um, and although the chief accountant has very basic knowledge, which is what we were given as a little heads up next to the exhibit, he has very basic knowledge. He's assured the directors that he can manage the whole project. Hmm. Okay. Again, I've got flashing red lights of ethical or unethical behavior here. The project's been approved by the board despite his private reservations because he hasn't said anything. He's not said anything. Yeah, he's kept quiet. Private reservations. So he hasn't voiced his concerns. And he's only recently qualified. Oh, that's quite a common one in um, ethics questions. And we already know the fact he wants to be employed on a permanent basis. So there's nothing new with that point. But I will just jot down the fact that he is newly qualified. OK, and so again, I can just dispense with those exhibits. I can always open up again if I need a sneaky peek later. And it just allows me a bit more space for me to see what's going on in my answer. So looking at the requirements, I got a good idea already what the issues are. I just need to sort them out. So at the moment, it's just a shopping list, and that's not going to earn you any marks whatsoever. And I need to then discuss the way in which the chief accountant should have acted. So kind of some follow-up points. So the actions to address the issues. Okay, so I'm looking for two parts to my answer, an issue and then an action. Now, remember, we're looking for two professional skill marks here relating to the ethics requirements. And for that two marks, you need to think very carefully about the quality of your answer. You need to think about good communication skills. So you need to think about putting structure into your answer. So we're going to think about using headings. We're going to think about the quality of our explanation. So certainly not bullet points and just a few words like I've put down here. I've got to build proper sentences together and a good strong argument. And when it comes to my actions, I need to make sure they're viable actions. I don't need to be jumping to conclusions and, and saying that, you know, he definitely shouldn't stand for this post because there might be things I can do to address the risks, safeguards that could be put in place that would make it OK for him to continue with his application. OK, that's what the examiner wants you to be focusing on for those two professional marks. It's not your technical answer. The professional marks are very much for the structure, the quality of your explanations and the strength of your arguments. So what is my first issue? Well, I think I'm going to pick up as my first issue this point around the fact that he is providing preferential payment terms 
in return for a good employment reference because he wants to be employed on a permanent basis. I think that's my first point. And for me, that smacks of self-interest. He's thinking about himself. He's not being independent. He's not being objective. So how about we have that as a heading? Because in ethics, you have your five principles in the ACA Code of Ethics. And one of those principles is objectivity. And it's great, again, if you can use those buzzwords, buzzwords in your answer. So I'm going to talk about objectivity. I'm going to delete that bit relationship, replace it with my heading objectivity. And I'm going to take these points here that I'm highlighting. I'm going to turn them now into my answer. You can leave them underneath. We can copy bits of them across to save some typing. I'm going to start with an introduction because this, again, is your professional skill marks you're aiming for. Accountants, I'm going to say, are required to demonstrate objectivity in their business dealings. Okay, rather a generic point, but it sets the scene nicely for them picking up what's happening in the scenario. The chief accountant, what, he's, what has he been up to? I'd say his objectivity has been affected by a self-interest threat. What has he done? And this is where you can do a bit of cutting and pasting. He has allowed Bedini some preferential payment terms. Actually, I could probably write it a bit more succinctly myself. He has allowed Bedini prefer or enhanced payment, oops, payment terms. And why has he done that? Why is there a self-interest threat? He's done it in order to secure a good employment reference. And why does he need a good employment reference? Because he wants to become a permanent employee at Calibra. So this is with the intention of supporting his application to become a permanent employee of Calibra. I suppose he's also doing it because he wants to impress the directors. He wants to win this business. It's not just about um, getting the job. It's wowing the directors that he managed to win this contract. So maybe I can weave that into my answer too. His objectivity has been threatened by a self-interest threat. He allowed Bedini enhanced terms to, first of all, to win their business and secondly, to secure an employment reference. Okay. And I think I can safely say I've covered off those points I picked up for my plan. Hopefully you agree. So that's that point done. Now, at this point in time, I could talk about my actions, but actually I'm going to come back and do my actions at the end. Um, once I've got a full picture, just in case I, I want to think more carefully about where I put my different actions. So the next thing was the use of this distributed ledger technology blockchain. Um, and my point here, well, let's have a quick reminder. The chief accountant is public to supporting this technology, even though... He doesn't seem to know very much about it. That's my point below. I think I'm going to change the order of these. I think I'm going to talk about his lack of knowledge first of all, and then I can talk about the rather scary technology afterwards. So I'm just going to put those points up here. Talk about them a slightly different way around. Did that work? Actually, let me just take that out there and put that at the bottom. So he is using, I've still got them in the wrong order, haven't I? Let's just try again. He has assured the directors he can facilitate the move. So I'm going to come back to the blockchain bit 
afterwards. He has assured the directors he can facilitate the move. He's got reservations about the system. And he wants to basically keep his mouth shut so that they go ahead and use it and he keeps his job. Hmm. We've already talked about objectivity, so don't repeat your point there about self-interest. I think here we need to be focusing on his professional competence and his professional behaviour. So I'm going to use that as my heading. Professional competence or incompetence, as the case may be, and his professional behaviour by not voicing his concerns. Again, professional competence and due care is one of the um, principles in the code of ethics, as is professional behaviour. So good buzzwords again to build into the answer. And I need to think about how I'm going to wrap these three points down here into a couple of good sentences. So I'm going to say, as a recently qualified accountant, The chief accountant, I'd say he lacks experience, wouldn't you? Lacks experience in his role as chief accountant, but he also lacks expertise in using the new technology. And that, if you remember, was the focus of the directors. They wanted to grow the system, so they wanted to use the system more heavily. So this is the focus of the director's growth plans for the business. Um, now I want to pick up about the fact he's, he's given the director's assurance that he can facilitate the move, but he doesn't really have the experience. So why is he doing that? He wants to impress the directors. So he has a desire to impress the directors. Why? Because they will be considering his future role at Calibra. And I'd say this has led to him... I've got to get those buzzwords in about professional competence, professional behaviour. So this has influenced his professional judgment because at the moment it's just a heading. I need to weed those words into my answer. This has influenced his professional judgment and behaviour as he has led the board to believe. He has the professional competence. There we go. That's my next buzzword from the heading now woven into my answer to manage the system. Okay, so I can take all of that and know I've covered it. So it's so important with these ethics questions that you're not just talking generically, that you're really hitting the details from the scenario. And that's why it's so great to be able to copy those details across when you're reading through the exhibits, put them there, and then they're there in front of you to remind you to build them into your answer. You can just then skim through what's left to make sure you haven't missed anything. Finally, we've got the chief accountant is public supporting the technology. He's got concerns over its reliability. And there's going to be quite a heavy use of this technology. So which buzzword are we going to use to describe this? Well, I'd say it's a lack of integrity that the chief executive, or the chief accountant, rather, is showing. So the chief accountant, let's just use some of the words that are here. The chief accountant is publicly supporting the technology despite, so just linking together a couple of the points straight from the question, despite having concerns over the reliability due diligence and the potential violation of local regulations. Now, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem if there's due diligence? What could go wrong for the business as a result? So let's really spell it out why it's so important he behaves with integrity. Because if we find that the transfer of the shares that takes place using this technology is illegal. So the due diligence 
um, and the, uh, the violation of local regulations, those concerns are found to be true, well, think about what the impact would be for Calibra. If the transfer of the shares using the system is illegal, illegal, this could result in fines and therefore impact on Calibra's reputation. I think it's really good to spell out why this is an ethical concern. Now, why do you think this has happened? I say it's because the chief accountant is just lacking confidence given he's new in his role. So the chief accountant's lack of confidence in his role and um, just the system really that he's a bit scared of challenging the use of the system. because he wants to impress the directors. So for fear of not supporting the directors' plans. I think that then shows, raises concerns about his integrity. And again, that's getting the buzzword in from my heading. Just read through that because that was a bit bitty when I put it together. Chief accountants, lack of confidence in his role and his fear to challenge the use of the system. Oh, I've got the fear twice. The, and his fear to challenge the use of the system uh, and his concerns. And his fear to flag... concerns over the technology around the technology raises issues raises um, or flags issues around his integrity there we go I'm taking more care with my wording than I would normally because of those professional skill marks. I've got two flags in here. I'm not doing a great job of this sentence, not the longest sentence. The chief accountant's lack of confidence in his role and his fear to flag concerns around the technology um, highlights, how about that? Highlights issues about his integrity. Now, have I finished my answer? Well, yeah, I mean, I've talked about the issues. I've broken it down into three issues. But what I now need to do to finish the question is think about what the chief accountant should do next. Now, in the examiner's report on this question, they said that lots of students spent time talking about the fact that the chief accountant shouldn't have accepted this contract with Bedini. The trouble is, it's too late. It's too late. He has accepted that contract. There's nothing I can do to backpedal. So really, the, the discussion around the further steps, there's nothing really to say for that first point. Yeah, obviously, he needs to be aware of it for the future, but I think we can pick up on that with my integrity, my professional competence and professional behavior points. I don't think there's actually any actions under the objectivity because it's too late to address them. The, the damage is done. But we can certainly come up with some actions relating to integrity. So if you wanted to, you could put a little heading actions, okay, or you could just start a new paragraph. In fact, if you wanted to, you could do all your actions at the end, but it's quite nice to marry up your actions with the issues. And the examiner has said in quite a few exam reports they like it when people marry the two together because it, they find it leads to a better quality answer. It makes you very focused on what actions um, you need to be thinking about to address the issues you just discussed. So integrity, the chief accountant is publicly supporting the technology. He's got these concerns. Um, the chief accountant's lack, lacking confidence in his role. He's scared to flag uh, his concerns. Uh, and that shows a lack of integrity. So what should he do? He needs to, he needs to man up. He needs to uh, engage in an honest discussion 
with whom? Well, with the directors, telling them what? Well, tell them about his inexperience. He's put himself forward as having this experience that he doesn't have, so fess up to the fact he doesn't have this experience around the distributed ledger technology. Or I could have just put technology for short. And they can then do what? Well, they can then decide whether he needs support. You know, maybe he never in the first instance on his CV mentioned that he had this. So no one can blame him for not having the expertise. And maybe all that he needs is some support from an expert in that field as the project unfolds. So they can consider whether he needs to be supported with the project or replaced by an expert in that field. And I've put that in the wrong place, haven't I? That probably fits better down underneath here under professional competence. Under integrity, it's more around the, the lack of due diligence, the potential violation. So what's he going to do there? Well, you know what? His concerns might be unfounded. So he should, well, he needs to investigate them. Again, don't assume the worst. It might be it's all hot air. He might have got worried unnecessarily just because of his lack of confidence. So he should investigate his concerns further. You know, before you go blowing that whistle, check your facts. He should consider the consequences. So what would happen if his concerns were found to be true? So have any flaws with the system and the viability of it managing this growth that the directors want? And again, this might require some expertise. And after having done this sort of groundwork, he should then raise any concerns he have again with the directors. Now, given it's so important to the directors the system is used, he might come across some resistance. He might come across the, oh, it'll be all right. The system will be fine. Get on with it. So, again, one of the things as an, an accountant we need to do is resist any pressure. So, he should resist any pressure to accept the role of managing or extending the system where he believes it to be unsuitable. So with ethics, what the examiner is looking for is practical solutions. You know, not just throwing you not just throwing everything out and saying, oh, I can't possibly continue in this job. There's quite often a way around it. If it's an accounting problem, you can discuss it with the director to make sure they're aware of the accounting problem. If it's, uh, if it's an undue pressure, it's trying to take yourself out of that situation where you feel under pressure so you can actually be, behave with integrity, behave with objectivity. So that completes my answer. I've completed parts A, B, and C. And I've given some thought in the ethics around writing proper sentences, well-crafted sentences, good arguments, good explanations about why I've got these concerns, exactly what there is in the scenario that's flagged that concern, and some hoping I would have earned some good marks along the way. Right, hopefully you've now found your way back to me. Has that all worked, Lucy? Yeah, you're all good now. Don't worry, it's fine. Great. Phew, that's a relief. So I've been busy beavering away answering questions. 
I'm sure I haven't got through everyone's questions. So we're going to have a Q&A session in a moment. But just before we do that, I wanted to say I hope you found that helpful. It's given you some hints and tips on planning and writing an answer and some bear traps to avoid. You also saw some tips to get the absolute best out of the exam software. And that's what I wanted to mention just briefly before we go into the Q&A. I am aware that some of you are doing paper-based exams, and I wanted to make it clear that all the messages I've made about planning, making sure you weave the facts from the scenario back into your answer still hold true. Um, I also want to flag a point in the examiner's report um, that commented that students actually did quite well in part A to this question, where they stuck to the scope of the scenario and didn't waste time on non-relevant aspects of IFRS 15. As for the ethics bit, the examiner criticised students who provided a boilerplate list of all the ethical things they could think about in the hope that some might hit the spot or fail to apply their point back to the scenario. Um, some people put an ethics point down, the examiner said, but didn't add any new insight or concern. So it's not just a case of copying from the scenario into your answer, but it's a thinking about now, why did I put that point down? What could the consequences be for the company as a result of this ethical concern? Now, as I said, the question box has been pinging away and everyone's been madly answering your questions in the background. I wanted to share with you some of the questions, and Lucy's going to pull those out for us, some of the questions that I think you might all benefit from hearing the answer to. And feel free to post any other questions into the chat box as we go along, and we'll get through as many as we can. And apologies up front if we don't have a chance to answer your specific question. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Claire. Um, if I may, I'd just like to start with the one. So you and I were just messaging about a particular set of questions that were coming in at a certain point in your video. Um, where lots of students were asking about the inventory, the borrowing, costs. Um, borrowing cost, yeah. And I was wondering, I think we had enough questions through um, for me to think that perhaps um, something was missed in the explanation. I think it's probably worth if you recapping what the types of questions you were getting and if you could kind of explain that a little more and then we can go on to the rest of the questions that we had. Perfect. So the borrowing cost, that's the IS23 part of the answer. The borrowing costs are capitalised, which means that rather than borrowing costs going to the P&L, where interest normally goes, it's instead added on to the associated asset. Now, in this case, the asset was inventory. So whilst you're building this property for your customer, it's sitting in inventory. And the cost of this borrowing the money from the customer to finance the construction is part of the cost of making the inventory. So you should have seen there were two journals that I produced in part B, which were explained in part um, in the first bit. The first journal was taking the interest for the first year, which I got to be 0.51 million, and I added that to inventory. Okay, and then the second journal in December X9 was 541,000, and I added that to inventory. Okay, so the final thing that perhaps I didn't put in my answer, which I probably should have done, a couple of you pointed it out to me, is that at the very end, when you release the revenue from deferred income, from that liability, when you release it to revenue, you would also take the inventory out of the statement of position and release that to cost of sales. But I do believe in my journals I had both years of the inventory covered, so maybe it's worth just going back and playing that little bit of the video again. Perfect. Thank you, Claire. Uh, next question I'd like to cover is a question that I think is, is really important that we cover, actually, because I'm sure that this, um, this will be relevant for, for many students listening. We have a student here asking whether questions always come up in reference to FRS 102 and UK GAP, and if so, in which section? Um, so it's, it's that whole UK GAP thing, if you could answer that, please. Yes, absolutely. So there are two versions of the FBR exam, and it was down to you as a student to decide which one of the two versions you wanted to apply to sit. So if you're not sure, that's something to make absolutely sure you know which version of the exam you're going to be finding on the day. Um, the, there's the international variant and there's the FRS 102, the UK GAT variant. It's got nothing to do with country you're based in, it's which exam you've chosen to do. Now, if you do the international variant, your whole exam will be on IFRS, not UK GAT. If you chose the UK GAT variant, the FRS 102 variant, most of your exam 
is going to be on IFRS. But in section B, one of the two questions in section B, who knows which one, one of the two questions in section B will have been adapted so that you'll have a slightly different version of that question asking you how it be accounted for under UK GAP rather than under FRS 102. And you can expect that to be between 15 and an absolute maximum of 20 marks. And it could be on any area. It could be numerical. It could be just explanations. It could be on single entities. It could be on groups. Okay, so hopefully that answers that. Lucy, if there's anything else you think I need to add there, let me know. No, that's perfect. Thank you. And really important that we cover it. Um, another great question. Uh, and again, we get asked this frequently, not just for SBR, for, for other exams as well. We have a student asking whether in the exam it would be appropriate for them to use abbreviations. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes, with one caveat. Abbreviations is a real time saver. Whether you're doing computer-based or handwritten or paper-based exam, abbreviations are an absolute godsend for saving time because this is a really time-pressured exam, so I'm sure you're starting to realise. Be careful, though, with your abbreviations. We don't want a sentence that's just full of three-letter abbreviations because it makes it quite difficult to read. So stick to the standard abbreviations, things like SFP for Statement of Financial Position, GW for Goodwill, NCI for Non-Controlling Interest. Somebody in the chat box earlier, earlier on suggested DD for, uh, what was it, date in the question? I can't remember what the, you see, it just goes to show that for me was not a standard abbreviation. So I would try not to have too many of them so your whole sentence isn't full of them, and your whole answer is just full of TLA, three-letter abbreviations, but by all means use them to speed up the writing of your answer. But there's one place where you should not use abbreviations. Do you know where that is? That's in the professional skills marks part of the exam. Here, you've been judged as a professional on your communication, your writing skills, and if you were sending a report, a professional report, you wouldn't have abbreviations in there. You would write everything out properly. So no abbreviations in the professional skills part, those two questions in part A and part B of the exam. Lovely. Thank you, Claire. Great advice. Um, Next question. Okay. Oops, bear with me one second. So we have um, a student here asking whether if they do their workings using formulae in the spreadsheet, do they still have to write that out in their explanatory section of the answer? Okay. Really great question there. You need to remember that the mark is going to get to see not just your word answer, but they'll also get to see your spreadsheet answer. Okay, so anything you do in the spreadsheet, you don't need to copy it or write it back into the Word. You just need to reference that there is a spreadsheet with a working in it. So you can write, you can say, for example, the revenue number is X, brackets working one, and they will then go looking for that working in the spreadsheet. Now, in the spreadsheet itself, you can use the, the functionality of the spreadsheet to do your calculations. You should not be doing calculations on a calculator. You should be doing them in the spreadsheet using the functionality. So the adding up, the multiplying, the dividing, do it within the cell. And then you don't need to write your formula down because if the marker wants to know what formula you've used, they can interrogate the spreadsheet and they can see what you've multiplied, what you've divided, what you've added to get your answer. So don't duplicate effort. Absolutely no need to go writing out the formula you've used. They can see it from the spreadsheet, and there's no need to copy the spreadsheet back into the Word document. They'll look at both of them, especially if you've referenced it through. Okay, thank you. And, and this next question is related, really, and I've just seen that we've had another student asking the same question coming through. So, so this question is more about... Um, whether students should be using both response areas, are they both marked? You've answered that really. Um, but should they just stick to one or should they be using both and how do they judge okay. which one to use? That's a good question. I mean, you noticed I didn't use both and that's because both aren't always made available to you in every single question of the exam. If it's a discussion question, there's very little number crunching. There's no need for the examiner to give you a spreadsheet to use. So you might find there's actually not one there. Um, but I would 
advise using the spreadsheet if you are doing calculations. And I was teaching revision this last week and I started writing an answer with my group and I started using the software and started writing it into the Word and I think, said to my students, oh, this is so difficult. I know I'm going to use a table. So I opened up a table in Word and then I thought, oh, why didn't I just use a spreadsheet? Because it does all the formatting for me. So if you're trying to, for example, work out something like Goodwill, don't do it in your Word document. You want to have the, the component parts that make up the goodwill in the first column of the spreadsheet. You can put the numbers in the second column of the spreadsheet. And even better, you can use the summation within the Excel to actually add up the spreadsheet, to add up your column of numbers. So again, you don't need to use the calculator and run the risk of making some keying and mistakes. So it depends very much on the question. But if it's something like a groups question or a, a question with lots of numbers in it, I would definitely make use of both the spreadsheet for the workings and then the explanations put into the word. It's not too difficult to have them both upon your screen if you take some time to lay out your screen up front. Is Thank that okay, you, Claire, and that, that's perfect. And that really, um, you know, that aligns with the advice that, that ACCA gives in our official resources is to um, absolutely make use of the spreadsheet functionality when it's appropriate because it can definitely save you time um, and just making sure that you are cross you know you're labeling things and then cross-referencing appropriately and, and absolutely not replicating answers across yeah. both response areas because then you're just um, you know you're yeah. duplicating the, the effort that you're having to put in and wasting time okay let's move on to the next question um, and this is from a student asking whether they need to mention the standard specifically in their answer. Yeah, again, it depends on the question. It's not like a bit of a stuck record, don't I, Lucy? But some questions will actually say, discuss the accounting in accordance with IFRS 15 revenue. Like this question here, it told you what the standards were. It told you you were to discuss IFRS 15 on revenue and IS 23 on borrowing costs. So frankly, there's no excuse for you to not know what the accounting standard numbers are. In other questions, and again, you'll find plenty of these in past exams, there'll be a scenario in order to say discuss the accounting. And it won't tell you what the accounting topics are or what the accounting standards are that you should be thinking about. So here, you don't need to learn accounting standard numbers. You don't need to be a big nerd and learn every IFRS number. That's not necessary. But what you do need to know is the names of the standards. You know, not necessarily work perfectly, but just for example, if you're looking at a scenario and you can see some shares are being issued to a supplier, you need to know that's a share-based payment. You don't need to know it's IFRS 2, but you need to know what the topic is that you're going to be addressing in your answer. Otherwise, you know, where do you go? If you don't know what the applicable standard is, your answer's not going to look very good. Or if it's a question where you've, um, you're looking at an investment, you'd say this is a financial asset. So you're showing you understand it's a financial instrument. So you don't need to know the accounting standard numbers, but you do need to know the topics of the different accounting standards that you want to refer to in your answer. And with these questions where they don't tell you what the accounting standards are to talk about, you're looking for breadth rather than depth. You want to look at all the accounting standards you think are applicable to the scenario rather than just the first two you found in copious amounts of detail because otherwise you will max out on the marking key on the two areas that you chose to talk about and the neglect of all the other things you could have been talking about. Lovely. Thank you, Claire. Right. We've got time, I think, for another two or three questions. Um, so the first of those, I really like this question. Um, we have the student asking whether the answer that you produced for part A in your video would be sufficient to score all five marks. Um, and I okay. think here they're referring to the fact that the, the published answer is probably a lot longer. Yeah, brilliant. Great question. So five marks is nine minutes. OK, not very long. And in that nine minutes, you've obviously got to work out what the hell's going on and think about how you're going to formulate your answer. So it's not nine minutes of writing, it's nine minutes of processing and coming up with what you think the conclusion is that you want to be writing about. It's not very long is what I'm trying to say. So it's almost impossible to write out the full answer 
that you might be referring to to write out the full answer in nine minutes. You know, even if I was just copying it from the back of a question bank or from the ACA's answer um, from the exam, it would probably take me more than nine minutes to do that. So the answers provided in the learning materials, the answers provided in the, um, the official answers that the ACA provide, they are meant to be very, very full answers, and you don't need to get every single point that is there. That's the, the kind of the fullest, fullest, fullest answer they can possibly think of. So short is beautiful in some respects. If it's been well thought out, you don't need long answers. Where students tend to have long answers because they've waffled, they've repeated themselves, or they've gone outside the scope of the requirement and they're talking about irrelevant stuff. So sometimes when you look at students' answers, you'll have a big paragraph, you'll a big fat zero, and that's because they've gone off topic. So short is beautiful. Planning up front gives you a short answer that's hitting the spot and answering all the different bits and pieces of the requirement. Thank okay. you, Karen. I hope that's great. I hope that that's um, reassured those of you listening. Yeah. I know that students do wor do worry about the, the length of our, our published yeah. answers. So I would say I would have got five out of five for that. And um, if you do find you've made points that aren't discussed in the answer key, then providing it's a relevant point, there'll always be extra marks available for that, providing it's a relevant point. Perfect. Um, just a quick question, actually, there. You mentioned, obviously, the five marks would equate to nine minutes. We did have quite a few questions coming in about the, the 1.8 minutes per mark. Um, yeah. I, I think we see that as a fairly standard way of, of kind of dividing up your time and giving yourself a bit of a buffer, but maybe not all students are familiar with that. So could you just explain a bit more about why you got to the 1.8 minutes per mark? Okay. So you have three hours and 15 minutes for the exam. So I would think about that as three hours for actually answering the questions, which is where I got my 1.8 minutes a mark from. Three hours is 180 minutes, 100 mark exam, 1.8 minutes per mark. And then I would think about the 15 minutes being divided probably equally over the four questions, so four minutes per question. And those four minutes is for me to do that exercise of working out how much time I'm going to spend on the question, working out how much time I'm going to spend on each part of the question, and also reading through the question. Not that I suggest you read the whole thing up front, but you need a little bit more time to be able to read each of the question um, requirements and the exhibits the extracts as you're going along. So that's what that extra buffer time is for. It's roughly four minutes for reading and for, um, uh, and for working out your time allocation. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Right, we've got time for one final question. Before I ask you this question, I just want to um, give a general reminder to the audience. Um, we've had lots of people asking whether they'll be able to listen to the session again, and the answer is yes. You'll receive an email tomorrow with details of how you can do that. If um, you don't want to wait that long, I think you can simply use the link that you used to register originally. That will just get you through to the on-demand recording. So please do make use of that. Um, and thank you to Claire for, for this great session. And thank you in advance for your um, answer to this final question and your <laughs> final comments. Um, so that for, this final question that I want to cover is, is worded in just a really, you know, I really feel for this student. And I think a lot of students will be feeling the same. So the student is saying they're feeling very overwhelmed at the moment by everything that is involved in SBR, all the standards, IFRS, all the calculations. You know, there's three weeks left. What's the best way um, that the student can spend that three weeks to, to kind of maximise their chances of success in the exam? Yeah, I think everybody watching at the moment feels the same way. It's that, oh my goodness, this is a vast syllabus and anything and everything can get tested. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to remember everything? And the honest answer is you can't. And that's why it's a 50% pass mark, not a 75 or 85 or 95% pass mark. You know, there are bits you can leave out of your answer. There are, there are aspects that you cannot do so well on and you can still pass the exam. So I think it's important that you are realistic with your expectations. What is important is making sure you practice questions. 
because time and time again, I see students who, you know, oh, I know this, I'm all over this. And then they look at a question and their exam technique lets them down. Their time management, for example, lets them down. Or how to interpret the requirement of the question. Do I, am I supposed to do journals here? Am I supposed to just do number crunching? Am I supposed to put an explanation alongside? You know, is it important I talk about just the first two points that come to mind or all the points? It's practice, practice, practice that will get you better at managing that exam technique and that time pressure. Um, and really, it just depends where you feel your weak, your weak spots are. If you know that you are weak on groups, then you know that question one in every exam is on groups. That's time well spent because you know it's going to get tested. The same with ethics. You know it's going to be in every single exam. So practice, practice, practice the ethics. So at least you've got some aspects of the exam that you can feel confident in. And if groups is not your favorite topic, I love groups, but if it's not your favorite topic, then don't start with that question. Start with something you are confident on. So you can flick through and maybe start with question four if that's going to be the area you feel happiest in. Other points I would say is that the clues are in the question. They are scenario-based questions for a reason. That's because by every little sentence, every little paragraph is little hooks to say, don't forget to talk about this in your answer. You know, if you've read through a sentence or you've read through a couple of sentences and can't, and, and it just, it's just glossed straight over, you've probably missed an accounting point to put into your answer. So be guided by the scenarios to help you out. And uh, there was one other sort of hot uh, topic that crops up in every exam, and that's conceptual framework. That can be your friend if you don't know the specific accounting standard. If you can't work out which specific accounting standard to refer to, you can always revert back to the conceptual framework because it's on that that all the accounting standards are built. So you can always think about, well, what would the conceptual framework say I should do about the, the, the recognition? Does this meet the definition of an asset? Should I recognize it? Um, and that will hopefully help you through any sticky points in the exam. OK, perfect. Thank you, Claire. I, I don't know if there are any sort of final comments that you wanted to give. Yeah, I was just going to say the very best of luck to everybody. Hope it all goes well. Keep your cool when everyone else around you may be losing theirs. So try and take a deep breath and carry on. Um, Lucy's mentioned in the resource section there's some um, uh, attachments you might want to have a look at. There's the, the examiner's report I referred to, the September, December 2020 exam. There's a PDF of my answer that I built up with you on the recording. Um, there's also a link to um, a video that I produced, which is on marking your own SBR questions. And there, I look at a selection of different requirements. I've mocked up an answer, and I go and I tell you whether I think this point would be worth one mark, half a mark, a good answer, a bad answer, which I know some of you are asking about how long a point does it need to be to get half a mark or one mark. Those sort of questions will be answered by that video. Thanks, Lucy. I'll hand back to you to wrap up. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. So, as I said, um, look out for your email tomorrow with details of how to listen to the session again. I really would echo what um, Claire just said about the marking video that, that she's um, worked on very recently. It, it's a hugely valuable video, and you can get the link in the resources section. And finally, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Claire for all of the amazing advice that, um, that she's given throughout the session. And thank you to all of you for joining and for all of your participation and your fantastic questions. Thank you very much, everybody, and best of luck in your exams. Bye-bye.